Environmental Law Update Web Conference Series. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Jennifer Bartz. Please go ahead. Welcome. I'm Jennifer Bartz with Foley and Lardner. We're so glad you could join us for today's web conference. In this program, we address critical energy and environmental concerns for next generation manufacturing. Speakers joining us today are Tom Maurer, Tom Maluli, Linda Benfield, and Sarah Slack. Tom Maurer is a partner and chair of Foley's environmental regulation practice. For over 30 years, Mr. Maurer has represented clients in environmental and regulatory matters, including air pollution, hazardous management, underground storage tank, groundwater contamination, and the siting of controversial projects. His practice includes real estate transactions, environmental contamination in issues, all types of environmental permitting, including air, water, waste management, wetlands, and endangered species. Compliance and enforcement matters, including audits, penalty negotiations, and multi-party settlements. Indoor air quality matters, OSHA issues, and military base closures. Tom Maluli is of counsel with Foley and vice chair of the energy industry team. He has in-depth experience across all regulatory aspects of the industry. Tom provides counsel on energy industry contracts, mergers and acquisitions, renewable project development, and state and federal and ISO compliance issues. He has led regulatory proceedings and litigation before FERC and in state commissions across the country. Linda Benfield is the managing partner of Foley's Milwaukee office. She is a member and former chair of the environmental regulation practice and has 28 years of experience in litigation and counseling in all aspects of environmental law, including air and water permitting and compliance issues, and solid and hazardous waste handling and disposal. Linda has extensive experience on the cutting edge of Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Superfund, and RICRA enforcement as well as citizen suit litigation, settlement strategies, and related cost recovery, insurance coverage, and indemnity disputes. Sarah Slack is senior counsel with Foley's environmental regulation practice and the life sciences and energy industry teams. Sarah divides her time between brownfield remediation and redevelopment, environmental compliance counseling, transactions, and environmental litigation. She counsels red residential and industrial property developers as well as municipal, nonprofit, and institutional clients with regard to remediation and brownfield redevelopment. Sarah also provides counsel to clients regarding air emissions, waste management, underground storage tank compliance, and water discharge permitting and compliance. Before I turn the presentation over to Tom Maurer to start things off, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on our website at foley.com by early next week, or simply download it from the files box along the right side of your screen. Get a slide, copy of the slides today. If you experience problems with Adobe Connect, please call 866-493-2825 for technology assistance. For audio assistance, dial star, then zero on your telephone to reach an operator. Today's program has been set up in both a discussion and interactive question and answer format. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Type your question into the Q&A box at the right side of the presentation slides. We will respond to written questions and also take live questions, time permitting, at the end of the program. To ensure you get the most out of today's presentation, we encourage all participants to maximize the PowerPoint to full screen usage. You can do so by clicking the full screen button located above the slides. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will be available on Foley's website by early next week. Foley will apply for CLE credit after the web conference. If you did not supply your CLE information upon reg registration, please send an email to Jennifer Bartz at jbartz at foley.com. Note. Those seeking Kansas, New York, or New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form. A four-digit code will be announced during the presentation. Use the code to complete the form, which can be obtained in the files box, or by sending an email to Jennifer Bart at jbart at foley.com. At this time, I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to Tom Maurer. 
Thanks, Jennifer. Um, just a few words before we get into the meat of the presentation about next generation manufacturing and Foley and Lardner. Um, the uh, conventional wisdom and the actual uh, facts in, in our society is that there is a, a slump in manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, that began to occur when a lot of jobs were sent overseas uh, to China or Asia or Mexico or South America. Uh, there is a, a change happening uh, in that a lot of the jobs are coming back, either through reshoring, which we'll talk about some in some more detail in the presentation, where um, jobs that, that did move uh, out of the country are coming back, or through just uh, regular um, expansion and development of, of manufacturing that, that was in the United States but it had uh, waned and is now uh, back on the move. Um, and there's there's been a lot of, of buzz about next generation manufacturing. Um, just to mention, much of what we say today will apply to just all kinds of manufacturing and not necessarily uh, some new cutting edge at manufacturing or some type of manufacturing that's been reshored. Most of the issues we talk about would apply equally to all kinds of manufacturing, but really a lot of attention has been refocused on manufacturing through this next generation type concept. Um, manufacturers going forward are going to be uh, looking at issues about whether they can compete and control costs, meet regulatory requirements, and have the right workforce. We're going to touch on several of these issues from the uh, side of energy and environment, environmental uh, compliance today. Um, <clears throat> here's a, we have a, uh, a larger next generation manufacturing uh, initiative with Foley, and these are some of the, the, the things that go beyond uh, energy and environment, uh, well as include some aspects of it, that we're working uh, with at Foley and Lardner. For information, we have a, a legal innovation hub for next generation manufacturers, and there's a link uh, to that. Uh, so if you want information that goes beyond this presentation about labor or taxes or um, all the other uh, customs issues or anything you can think of uh, practically that deals with next generation manufacturing, uh, we've got it covered and you can find out more about it uh, at this link. With that, I'm going to turn it over. Tom Malouli. Oh, one more. Um, just uh, uh, Tom's going to talk about energy, then Linda and Sarah are going to talk about sustainability, and I'll close it out talking about siting, reshoring, and closure. And now I'll turn it over to Tom. All right. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, as Tom said, it's really an exciting time these days to be involved in the manufacturing sector. And just since since the end of the recession in 2009 in the U.S., we've seen a increase in manufacturing manufacturing output of 18 percent last year it was a record two trillion dollars contributed to our economy through manufacturing our manufacturing sector alone is larger than the entire economies of all but seven countries and our exports have reached an all-time high so it's a time where many people in the industry in the manufacturing industry are thinking this is the time for us uh, this is where where we're going to achieve our growth there's lots of uh, good things ahead one of the things that people are focused on is uh, how to save money on energy, and that's going to be the, the focus of my talk. I, I, we've been involved at Foley for 170 years with manufacturers. That's as long as Foley's been in existence. We've also been involved pretty much since the original incorporation of electric and natural gas utilities you know, back in the late 1800s. So we've actually come at the energy use in manufacturing from, from both sides, both from the energy side and from the manufacturing side. And in my own practice, I, I've uh, represented people in all phases of the industry. So what are we seeing today in the, the overall energy marketplace? Energy costs represent about 2% of the overall cost of manufactured goods, this is according to uh, EIA reports. That compares to about 15% for labor, 50% for raw materials. So it's not huge in the overall uh, picture, but it's an important element. Right now, over the past few years, U.S. energy costs are, are so low that they're reflecting a competitive advantage over nine of our largest trading partners. These lower cost trends that we've seen, mostly attributable to uh, fracking and the increased use of domestic natural gas supplies. A couple of facts here. 
between 2006 and 2010, manufacturers experienced a decline in energy costs of 11%. And until this polar vortex winter that at least is still going on where I'm living, uh, that trend would have continued. Just this week in Houston, the president of the National Association of Manufacturers was giving his annual State of Manufacturing address. And he said that perhaps the most important force boosting the manufacturing sector today was the boom in domestic en energy production. So despite being just 2% of the overall cost, this really is a driving competitive advantage. He cited the example of a, a methanol plant in Houston that had been closed for the last nine years that had just recently reopened because of the price advantage that they were seeing with domestic supplies. And that is part of the overall projections that we see today of usage. Uh, the facts in the annual non-renewable energy expect expenditures for the energy industry projected to grow from $206 billion in 2010 to $584 billion in 2014. So it's definitely an important part of, of what manufacturers are doing now is where their energy costs are coming and their energy expenditures. Another interesting fact, in the U.S. and for the electric markets, there are 17 states in the District of Columbia which currently allow electric competition, retail electric competition in their energy markets. Since uh, from between 1997 and 2012, we've seen the rates drop in those states that have retail electric competition 1.7% compared to regulated states where we've seen an increase of 10.1%. I should say that's a, perhaps a little bit uh, misleading in that the, the states that first led the way in uh, retail electric competition probably had the, the highest energy costs begin, and that's, uh, that was part of the reasons why driving them towards retail competition. So that's what's overall going on in the energy marketplace. It presents a real opportunity to manufacturers to, you know, how can we take advantage of the, the benefits that we're seeing in the overall marketplace. And what I'm going to talk about now is, is basically an overview of the basic steps that manufacturers are taking today or that could be taking that can sort of drive your thinking and drive, the, drive you to a conclusion of, you know, here's what we ought to be doing uh, with energy expenses. Overall, this is a cycle. You might be at any point in the cycle today as a manufacturer. Uh, you might be focused on one thing. And yet, as you reach the efficiencies, reach the improvements in whatever your current project is, you'll end up driving back to the beginning of the cycle and sort of re-examining re the, whole, the, the whole process again. Each one of these uh, subjects that I'm going to touch on could probably be a presentation in and of itself. Uh, so consider this kind of an overview. So where would you start? First, you need to have a responsible manager, and you need to determine what the goals are going to be for that manager and for the enterprise. Overall, for the what I mean by a responsible manager, it needs to be somebody with enough authority within the corporation, within the company, to, you know, one, make things happen, and to two, drive change if change is what is needed. The goals. What are the goals that people are adopting? You know, some, some of the clients that we work with are just saying, you know, what we need, given everything that we're experiencing in the marketplace today, we just need to lower costs. We're willing to take some risks as long as we can drive costs lower. That's the main advantage that we're looking for. We need to make sure that whatever we're doing in the energy sector is going to drive our costs lower. Other people are saying, no, you know, what we, we have a budget that we need to, that we need to plan for, and what we, what's most important for us is that we have some kind of predictability over the next year, two year, three year horizon. It's hard to get predictability a lot long, you know, beyond that sort of horizon. But they're saying, they're telling me, if we can get that predictability and lock it in for now, then we're going to be okay and we're going to be able to uh, make our money in other parts of the business. Others are thinking, you know, what are their overall corporate values? And this is where we, you'll hear some later about, you know, a focus on sustainability, a desire to portray the enterprise as a, a green effort, that you're friendly with the environment. Uh, it might be part of the marketing effort. It might be part of the, the overall goals of the, the corporation or the founders of a, of a company. So any of those things, you sort of got to determine for that manager, and the manager might be part of this. You know, here's what we're trying to do with, with our overall energy portfolio. So once you've sort of got that in place, the next step is to establish a baseline. What is it today? How, how today are we using our energy? How much are we paying for it? Where is it going? And, and, uh, and how's it, where is it coming from? 
two, two basic ways you can do this. You, you can start, you can do it internally. And, and all that really requires is uh, to look at all the, the bills for a particular facility or for your entire fleet of manufacturing operations. Uh, a, a careful study going back over years can show really interesting trends, not only in cost, but in usage, time of usage, time of day, time of season, what's the seasonality of usage, you know, where is it overall? You sort of have to have that baseline in order to figure out, well, what are the goals going to be? How are the goals going to relate to that baseline? Another way to, do, uh, to establish this baseline is to have uh, an external consultant come in and do that study for you. It's important in negotiating the, the, the contract with that consultant to figure out, you know, to have close, frankly, close legal review of the agreement. There are times where a consultant will come in and, and their whole goal is to say, you know, we will, we'll, we'll measure what you use today, we'll help you reduce that over the next year, and we'll take a cut of, of whatever reductions you have so it'll be no cost to you. And that might be a perfect model for a particular manufacturer and for a particular consultant. But there are other ways to do those contracts. And um, so I'd suggest that as you do that, that you have outside legal or internal legal, legal review of what the contract will be so that both parties' interests are aligned. So after you sort of have that sense of here's how we're using energy today, one of the things you, you need to think about is, well, do we have the ability or what are our options today to generate some of that electricity ourselves? or to, uh, to bring in natural gas uh, for our own energy usage on site. Interesting fact, in 2010, as much as 28% of the total energy consumed in manufacturing came from non-purchase sources. That includes uh, using waste, comb combustion of waste or byproducts on site, or it might be through ownership of uh, generation facilities that you have on site basic kinds of self-generation options that, that, that people have in play today, cogeneration. Typically, a cogeneration facility would have been something that would have been designed facility you know, at, at the same time, and it would have been integrated in with the industrial process of whatever uh, manufacturing operation is going on. With what we're seeing more in the marketplace today with retrofitting facilities are that people are putting on, uh, adding wind turbines to sites or they're putting solar arrays up on rooftops. Some examples and for wind, uh, Honda just recently put in two wind turbines at their Ohio transmission plant and are projecting 10,000 megawatt hours a year, a year out of that. Uh, GM, also in Ohio, just put on a, a 1.8 megawatt solar array on their Ohio plant. Uh, Volkswagen's doing the same thing in Tennessee. Frito-Lay has a 0.2 megawatt solar array, array on a facility in Arizona. The interesting things with a lot of these options is, you know, where's the capital going to come from in order to, to create this project? Where, what's going to happen with the electricity? How is it going to affect my electricity price? What happens if we end up at a certain point generating more electricity than we're using at our own facility? There's a variety of, of ways, model structures, that, that these self-generation options um, have, have utilized in the marketplace. Some of them, there's net metering tariffs that, people might, that utilities might be providing. Where they will buy back extra energy. Others, the entire capital investment is, is borne by a third party, and you end up having an electricity contract with that third party, and they'll interact with the utility for you. There's a lot of varieties, a lot of options going on. So. That's, that's another step then, figuring out what kind of self-generation options do we have. Another step, to look at just for your own electric usage, uh, what kind of competitive supply options do we have at our facilities? Um, this is, for retail usage, this is one of those things that it's not available in every state. I've worked with clients who have you know, 15 facilities throughout the country, and there might be four or five that, are, that happen to be cited in states where they have competitive supply options. So if you have one of those, if you're in one of those uh, situations, you'll likely have consultants who, who will come to you and say, you know, I can help you get the best price uh, among all these suppliers. Some, you, some people might have an internal energy manager that, that runs that process themselves. I've helped clients set up auctions where the, the first thing that you do is you 
figure out who are the competitive suppliers who, who are willing to offer me services. The second step that you do, negotiate terms and conditions for contracts with each of these suppliers uh, who are, have expressed an interest in participating and trying to, to win your load. Um, the suppliers typically will come in and, and say, you know, come in with their form contract. Um, those form contracts are negotiable. Um, and what you'll want to do before you run an auction is actually get all the terms and conditions locked down. Because once you run the auction, and they will, they will all be offering a price, and typically the price that they offer will not be uh, available for more than 48 hours. So during that time, you need to be able to lock in. And if you haven't yet negotiated terms and conditions with the suppliers, you'll be in a bind and you'll end up having to agree to whatever form contract that they have if you want to get the most competitive price that you've seen in the auction. So it's important to negotiate those agreements beforehand. Uh, another thing then, in the other states where you might not have uh, retail competition, there's you know, utilities, cooperatives, municipalities who are all be there uh, offering uh, potential energy sources for you. Um, it's important to be working with utility tariffs. Um, when's the last time your energy manager should ask himself or herself, when's the last time that I actually sat down with the utility tariff, went through it, and figured out for myself you know, what is the best class that, that I could be in, what's the best class of service. Um, the utilities will often be there and will often uh, provide advice, suggestions, um, but it's really important for you to take it upon yourself to say, I need to look at this for myself and figure out, you know, where is it? Are there better alternatives here um, than, than perhaps the, the utility is informing me about, about? It also leads to participation in utility rate cases. Uh, in most states, there'll be a, a, a coalition of large energy users that will become a regular participant in regulatory proceedings before uh, a state commission. And they'll get involved in either pushing for your ideas of how tariffs ought to be restructured, or in general just uh, pushing, the, pushing the price of energy as low as they can get it, given the overall demands that the utility has to meet in order to uh, be able to provide decent service. Contract tariffs. A contract tariff is uh, a one-off agreement where a particular customer sits down with the utility and says, you know, given the, and the utility agrees, Given all the conditions involved today, we need to do a one-off agreement just with this customer, and we'll need to get it presented to and approved by our state commission. And typically what you'll see in these situations is first the customer has some sort of self-generation option. They might go to the utility and say, look, we're looking at putting, a, putting in a boiler to generate some of this, or we're looking at putting in a solar array, or we're looking at increasing the efficiency of one of our units. And, and it's going to cost us a lot of money to do that. But before we do that, we want to see if, if there's anything you can do with your particular tariff, with your, with your arrangements, that would make it more beneficial for us to stay with you as a customer than to self-generate our, our, ourselves. In that situation, the utility can be incented to say, OK, rather than lose your particular load and have all the rest of our customers lose the benefits of having your payments into the system, we'll sit down with you and negotiate this particular tariff. Uh, as long as, from a state commission's point of view, as long as they end up seeing some sort of net benefit to all the customers on the utility, um, they, they will often end up approving a, a contract tariff like that. Finally, you might be located in a, in a service territory of a cooperative or a municipal utility. In these situations, the best thing to do is to go in and sit down with the general manager of the, uh, the, uh, of the co-op or of the muni. They will often be, uh, be very interested in talking with you and working through whatever, uh, whatever issues you might have, helping you reach the goals that you have. They're often more directly accessible and often have a, more, a little more leeway in what they can do than a, a fully regulated investor-owned utility in most states. OK, a, a final step. Demand response opportunities. Just a couple facts. First, demand response, basically what it is, uh, an industrial customer, often be a big, large user of uh, electricity, perhaps throughout the day, perhaps, uh, perhaps they just have peak times. Demand response is basically saying, I'll shut off my, my equipment, or I'll allow the utility to shut off my equipment, 
at certain times when the utility is experiencing its own peak demand. Um, and in order, and just for being willing to do that, the, the customer who enters that demand response program will often get a break on what its electricity costs are. And in particular times when it gets shut down, it can often get uh, additional payments. So it's, but it's fully voluntary participation. But it's been growing like gangbusters. Uh, FERC today is estimating that the potential contribution from all U.S. demand response programs is nearly 72,000 megawatts. That's about 10% of the overall U.S. peak load today. Much more substantial growth is expected in this. Curtailment payments in 2000, or by 2019 are expected to reach $4.3 billion to manufacturing uh, users. So this is definitely an area, if you haven't thought about it yet, it's definitely an area that manufacturers should be saying, how is it that we can participate in this program? And you'll find that the, the answers to that are, again, all defined by either a state utility tariff or uh, um, uh, an ISO tariff, so in PJM or the Cal ISO or um, in, up in uh, New York, the NISO. They will have their own requirements in order to fit in. And there'll be some programs that are aggregating load where a consultant might come in and say, you know, if you join our aggregation program, we'll take care of all the details for you and, and, we'll, and we'll, you know, end up checking your bills and sending you the payments. Or you could uh, participate it in directly yourself as an individual customer. There was one Illinois customer, I think it, it received $400,000 in payments in 2010 just for being a part of a program. Uh, demand response program, and it ended up only being shut down once during the year. And during that shutdown, it, it used the opportunity to just do some long uh, delayed maintenance that it had needed to get done anyway. All right, so to wrap this up, manufacturers should be thinking of themselves as being very attractive load for uh, electric providers in particular. The, the, you're bringing an asset to any system. So for instance, if you're thinking about where should I be siting a, uh, a new facility, you know, often manufacturers will be thinking to go talk to the governor or talk to the mayor and see what kind of break. The thing that you should be thinking of is looking at, you know, what are my energy costs going to be in this particular place? Go in and, and uh, first talk with Phil if you need to, but then talk with uh, electric providers and say, you know, what will, it, what will my overall uh, usage look like, what my overall cost be if I end up siting in this particular place. You've got negotiating leverage, whether you're in a uh, regulated market or in a competitive market. Because of the load profile and because of the need for every electric provider to have as many customers as it can and to, ha and to serve as much load as it can, you actually have leverage. A lot of customers will think, well, the utility is the utility, the tariff is the tariff, I, I'm really kind of stuck here. But the fact is you do have leverage. There are a lot of opportunities today in the electric marketplace. Um, there's opportunities to improve corporate image. There's opportunities to improve your contribution to the overall economy. There's opportunities to, to save money. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Linda, who's going to be focused on, on the opportunities in the sustainability area. Linda? Thank you, Tom. Sarah and I are going to talk about a number of sustainability issues for next-gen manufacturers. And, you know, Tom talked about the energy market. You can't talk about environmental sustainability without talking about energy usage as well. That's a key environmental sustainability issue. And so just a couple of things to keep in mind. A lot of our clients are doing energy audits, and through that they're finding inefficiencies in their system. They're finding ways that they can optimize energy cycles, as Tom talked about, and other resources. Certainly when people are constructing, reshoring, or renovating, they're looking now to incorporate energy efficiency measures in what they're doing and considering sustainability in their design. One theme that you'll see me repeat a couple of times through this presentation is that there's an opportunity now as some of these national and international standards are being developed to participate with other stakeholders uh, in the regulatory process as some of these things are being developed to make sure that you can optimize the advantages that you can take out of those. There's also increased shareholder activism regarding sustainability and some recent changes in how the SEC looks at shareholder proposals on this issue are giving shareholder activists a much bigger voice in sustainability. One way that a shareholder 
can request a company's action is by making a proposal under Rule 14A8. This is the rule that allows a shareholder to submit a recommendation or a requirement that the company or its board take action and have that be included in the company's proxy materials for a shareholder vote. And those can either be asking the company to disclose the information that it has on sustainability issues or be requesting that the company actually take action on a sustainability initiative going forward. Now, not every proposal results in a shareholder vote. So if a company objects to the SEC, there's a number of grounds by which these proposals can be excluded from the proxy materials. And the most common ground is where the proposal deals with a matter that relates to the company's ordinary business operations. Until 2009, the SEC staff viewed proposals that called for what they called an evaluation of risk to be related to the company's ordinary business operations. And most sustainability proposals up until that time were excluded from the proxies on those grounds. But in 2009, the staff said that they would look at the subject matter of the risk and whether the subject matter involves a matter of ordinary business to the company. So now if the subject matter transcends day-to-day -day business matters and it raises policy issues that are so significant that it would be appropriate for a shareholder vote, then it generally will not be excluded as long as there's a sufficient nexus between the nature of the proposal and the company. So more shareholder sustainability proposals are making it into proxy statements now. And I've given you a couple of examples on these slides. Um, one example in PPG, with respect to PPG industries, in this one, a shareholder proposal was allowed where they were requesting that the company report on the environmental impacts of their operations in the communities in which the company operates. Another one that was allowed with respect to PNC Financial Services Group was a shareholder proposal asking that the company assess the greenhouse gas emissions that are impacted in its lending, investing, and financing activities. One that was disallowed uh, is the FLIR systems. That one was one where the proxy was requesting a report on the company's strategies to manage energy expenses. And I, I think that the, uh, the distinction you can draw is that the sustainability itself is considered a significant policy issue for the staff but a simple cost reduction is not. Now, there's a number of ways to respond to these proxy statements. Um, the first one and, and the and initial one is to be proactive. And to the extent that you hear that these things are being developed and that there may be a request, is to provide, if you've, if you've got it, previously prepared information, the kind of information that would be included in the proxy asking to be provided. Another one is to simply open a dialogue and negotiate with the shareholders before the proposal is issued and find out if there's something that can be done to address their concerns before it rises to the level of a proxy. There's also a number of procedural grounds uh, that these can be dismissed. For example, some shareholders are actually not entitled to exercise those rights under the SEC rule. Um, but if it is actually made, you can consider it negotiating and agreeing with the shareholder to moot the proposal because, in fact, these kind of environmental and social policy proposals uh, have the highest percentage withdrawn in connection with direct dialogues between the company and its shareholders. There's also one other SEC requirement to keep in mind that's been out there for a while, and this is the 2010 guidance that requires companies to look at three different kinds of risks that relate to sustainability and climate change type issues. And one is that they have to actually assess the impact of existing and potential climate change litigation and international treaties in their statements. They also have to look at the indirect consequences of climate change. So for example, is there going to be decreased demand for the products that they make as a result of um, greenhouse gas producing products and some of this pending legislation? And the third thing that companies are required to do is to assess the impact of the actual physical effects of climate change on their business. And in some cases, that, that involves rising sea levels to the extent that they own property uh, in areas that might be impacted. I told you one theme was going to be monitoring regulatory developments. And so as I want to re repeat again that to the extent that some of these global and national sustainability initiatives and requirements are being developed, 
we have clients that are trying to shape those directly or trying to work through trade associations to have an impact on where those are. And always to the extent that there are incentives or tax credits or grant programs or energy efficiency requirements, those kinds of things being considered by lawmakers or by regulatory agencies, there may be opportunities to take advantage of that with respect to new products, with respect to existing products that you might want to have meet the standard, um, or even marketing claims. Another thing we wanted to cover with respect to sustainability and where our clients are touching that area has to do with third-party requirements and some certifications. So for example, Walmart has a sustainability index. And they use that to evaluate the sustainability of the products and its own supply chain. So right now, they use that to evaluate each of the goods that they buy. And although right now they consider this to be a voluntary program, Eventually, all of the Walmart buyers are going to have sustainability goals built into their own performance objectives. In addition, there's a couple of sustainability certifications that our next-gen manufacturing clients might be interested in. One is the Forest Stewardship Council. They have 10 principles and 57 criteria by which they certify forests around the world. Sarah's going to talk in a moment about some of the issues to think about with these kinds of certifications and claims and marketing advantages that you might want to take with, with respect to some of these. And then finally in my comments, I just want to note that many of our clients are performing supply chain sustainability evaluations. And they're doing this either because they're getting direct shareholder pressure to do so, or they have a third party requirement like the Walmart example to go out and do it. And some of them are doing it on their own initiative because they want to be a leader in that area. And in that evaluation, they are assessing and, and trying to improve the sustainability impact of each of the raw materials in their own supply chain. So there's a couple of, of external um, programs that you can look at with respect to that. One, the United Nations has a global compact where the signatories into the compact are encouraged to engage with their suppliers around 10 specific sustainability principles. And then the recent series Global Reporting Initiative, that's an international standard for sustainability reporting. And recently they've put an increased focus on sustainability throughout the supply chain. Sarah. Thank you, Linda. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So one aspect of sustainability is that companies have started to use green marketing claims. And so I'm going to talk today a little bit about some information about the FTC's green guides. So as a starting point, what are green marketing claims that are the subject of the green guides? Green claims are claims that are made based on certain environmental attributes of a product or its packaging, as well as claims that are made based on the environmental impact of a product or its packaging. So in the recent past, companies have realized that consumers have become more interested in supporting environmentally friendly production processes and products. And so companies have capitalized on this interest by using green marketing claims to demonstrate some of the uh, renewable materials or recycled materials that they're using, and then also to attract co consumers to their products. Some examples of green marketing claims include claiming that a product is compostable or recyclable, claiming that a product is free of something. So a recently very common free of claim is BPA free. Uh, claiming that a product is non-toxic, claiming that a product is made with renewable energy or, or, or materials, and claiming that a product was produced using carbon offsets. Now these are just some examples. There are a number of environmental uh, green marketing claims that can be made. So where do the green guides come from? So the Federal Trade Commission has authority under Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act to prevent unfair and deceptive advertising. As such, under this authority, the FTC has developed the green guides guidance documents. The green guides are codified in the regulations at 16 CFR Part 260. And however, although they are in the regulations, the FTC has made pretty clear that the green guides really are just guides. And Part 260 does not contain any specific enforcement provisions. Rather, it provides the FTC's interpretation of what types of green marketing claims are acceptable and what types of claims the FTC would consider as unfair and deceptive. So the green guides have been around since 1992. But the FTC issued a major revision to the guides in 2012. The revised guides 
the revised guides are intended to provide further clarity regarding green marketing claims so as to prevent deceptive and misleading advertising of environmental attributes. The green guides cover a number of specific environmental claims, um, but the overall focus of the guides is to prevent deceptive and misleading advertising by requiring substantiation and qualification of any green claims. The guides require that a company must have scientific evidence to substantiate any specific claim. So for example, if a company states that a product is compostable, the company must have the scientific evidence to support this claim in its possession before making the claim about the product. And then the FTC generally frowns on what are considered to be general environmental claims, like claiming a product is green or eco-friendly, because those terms are very vague and don't specifically convey the basis for the green marketing claim. Another element of the green guides is the FTC's focus on making sure that companies accurately and adequately qualify claims. So going back to the compostable example, if a product is only compostable in an industrial composter, then that is a necessary qualification to prevent deceptive and mis misleading claims. Otherwise, a consumer may choose to purchase a product based on a claim that it's compostable and then discover that it actually won't compost or break down in its home con composter. And so that's an example of a claim that would be deceptive if not properly qualified. The FTC also has some very specific requirements for the, use, for the proper use of environmental certifications and seals of approval. The green guides cross-reference to the FTC's endorsement guide, which requires marketers to disclose any material connections to, certifying, to the certifying organization and also requires marketers to, that they should not use certifications or seals that do not clearly convey the basis for the certification unless the basis is otherwise clearly and prominently provided as well. So the green guides don't cover all types of green claims. Specifically, uh, they do not cover claims that, are, that a product is organic, and that's because organic certification is regulated by the United States Department of Agriculture. And the USDA has some very specific regulations in place about what types of products can be, can be uh, claimed as being organic and what kinds of claims can be made about those products. The Green Guys also don't specifically include uh, requirements for claims that a product is sustainable or natural. These types of claims kind of fall into the category of general environmental claims that the FTC doesn't usually like to see. And the FTC actually specifically considered including these two, ter these two terms uh, in the, the updated revision in 2012. But ultimately, the agency determined that it lacked sufficient evidence about what would actually make a product sustainable or, nat or natural. So those, those two types of claims are not included in the, in the green guides. So since the green guides were released, they're re-released in 2012, the uh, FTC has brought several recent enforcement actions that show that it does intend to hold companies accountable for their green marketing claims. I've got a couple of examples of those here. So in late 2013, the FTC brought an enforcement action against ECM Biofilms, Inc., which is an Ohio-based company that made a plastics additive and claimed that the plastic products made with this additive would break down in approximately nine months to five years in nearly all landfills or wherever else the products may have ended up. The FTC claimed in its complaint that the plastics did not actually break down in a relatively short period of time, as ECM claimed, and the FTC was seeking to prevent ECM from making the biodegradable claims without sufficient evidence or qualification. Uh, I believe that that is scheduled to go to a hearing uh, in June of this year. So the FTC also brought several similar actions against four smaller companies that were making similar biodegradable claims. And notably, a couple of those uh, companies were customers of ECM and were using ECM's additives in their products and were making claims based on ECM's claims as well. So the FTC also brought an enforcement action against AJM Packaging, which is a manufacturer of paper products, but included, including paper plates, cups, bowls, napkins, and bags. The FTC claimed that AJM violated a 1994 consent order that had barred AJM from representing that any product or package is degradable, biodegradable, or photodegradable unless AJM had competent and reliable scientific evidence to substantiate the claim. So despite the terms of the 1994 order, AGM began making new environmental claims for a number of its products, 
uh, including claims that they are biodegradable, compostable, or recyclable. So the FTC's 2013 complaint charges that AJM violated the 1994 order by failing to have competent and reliable evidence to substantiate its claims. The FTC issued a $450,000 penalty to AJM and was seeking a new order to prevent AJM from making unsubstantiated and, qualified, and unqualified claims going forward about its products. So what are some best practices that we can take uh, with respect to green marketing claims? So companies wishing to make green marketing claims should review the recently revised 2012 Green Guides to determine the appropriate substantiation and qualification that is required for any green marketing claims, and should update their marketing packaging materials accordingly. Uh, one important factor is to always make sure that a company possesses the scientific evidence to substantiate its green marketing claims. This is particularly uh, significant in light of the recent enforcement actions where um, a number of the parties that were ECM customers were relying on ECM's claims but did not themselves have the scientific data to support their biodegradability claims. And it was not enough for those companies to rely on uh, ECM. The, the uh, FTC said that they needed to be able to substantiate and have the evidence themselves. And then uh, another best practice is that companies should also make sure to properly qualify any claims. So recalling again the compostable example, if a product is only compostable in an industrial composter, then that is a qualification that should be prominently made. And then finally, companies should make sure that any certifications or seals of approval comply with both the green guides and the FTC's endorsement guides. And now I'm going to hand the presentation over to Tom Maurer, who is going to discuss siting, reshoring, and closure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, the good news in our economy is that manufacturers are looking to expand, build new plants, move operations from overseas back to the, to the U.S., and so um, that's all good news. Uh, to talk about reshoring, reshoring is the act of bringing outsourced personnel services or facilities back to the location from which they were outsourced. So a lot of jobs and a lot of plants went uh, to other countries, and now they're coming back. And uh, um, there are a number of uh, different studies and different statistics, some as high as over 50% involved in reshoring. Uh, there's an MIT study that I'm citing here. Uh, 198 multinational manufacturers were surveyed. 15% are I engaged in actually doing the reshoring and moving production back to the U.S. 34% are considering reshoring, and this, uh, based on the survey, that's more than just uh, pie in the sky thinking about it. They're actually putting their plans together to get it done. So uh, it's a it's a large movement. It's really happening, and uh, there's there's consequences from it. The reasons for reshoring, there are a lot of them. A few of them are uh, the, the labor costs, which uh, was one of the big factors in, in jobs and production facilities moving overseas are getting closer together. Um, labor costs in the U.S. are rising very slowly. They're rising very rapidly in the rest of the world, so that delta is, is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, productivity and technology. Um, nowadays, uh, when these new manufacturing facilities are open, they have a lot less uh, workers than they used to, uh, much higher productivity, uh, so that factors into it. Uh, we've already uh, talked about energy costs. That plays into uh, jobs moving back. Supply and distribution, uh, a lot of the, if your customer base is in the U.S., uh, you, you have a lot less logistics and costs associated with your supply chain. Uh, proximity to research development and, manu and management, um, you, get, you get a lot um, more uh, productivity and action on innovation uh, in those kinds of situations. So um, there's a lot of good reasons uh, for, um, for jobs and production facilities moving back. Another one that is sometimes mentioned uh, but is sometimes disputed is uh, that we make things better in the U.S., so there's a fewer product recalls and uh, higher quality of, of goods uh, provided by manufacturing here. Um, environmental regulations overlay. The Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovations uh, did a study, and they came up with 2,183 unique regulations for manufacturers in the U.S. That's a lot of regulatory requirements. Uh, 
of, by far most of those are environmental, 972. So there's a lot of regulatory requirements. And obviously, when you've got that kind of uh, regulation, um, you're going you're gonna to have to deal with that uh, when you decide where you're going to build your new facility. Reshoring is um, a phenomenon that is, is uh, leading a lot of the development of new facilities, but uh, reshoring is really just one aspect of it. Uh, manufacturers are building new greenfield facilities, whether they're coming from, from uh, uh, overseas or uh, just the domestic uh, need that's, that's being served by the development of a new production facility. The redevelopment of unused facilities uh, and the, the, all of the issues that come along with retrofitting, uh, modification of existing operating facilities and how you uh, make the changes necessary in your environmental permitting and, and regulatory requirements for that. Uh, the areas of regulation, pretty familiar to everybody who's, who's in this area. You've, you're going to have uh, many manufacturers are obviously going to have air permitting. They're going to have waste that they generate. Um, often you're going to have wastewater, uh, industrial wastewater, NPDES permitting. Material storage and transportation, uh, there has been a big increase in requirements for materials, uh, uh, noncompliance with material transportation requirements, uh, FAA enforcement actions. Uh, there's been a move to international standards for shipping. There's been some confusion uh, as to how compliance is going to be achieved with the new international shipping regulations as those are implemented worldwide. Uh, there's uh, a, a development under which uh, the carriers of uh, air uh, and uh, other rail as well, uh, those carriers have, have um, made arrangements with the regulators so that they report any suspicious packages. Uh, if there's a smell, if there's a discoloration, if there's anything like that, they will tell the regulators, such as the FAA, and then there'll be an inspection and there'll be an enforcement action and the penalties are, are pretty steep and that's, that's an ongoing development. Um, pollution prevention, uh, going along with sustainability, as you design your new operation, you want to minimize the amount of, of uh, emissions and waste that you generate and water that you discharge and incorporate, they, incorporate that into your design. When you're doing new greenfield type development or even an expansion, you've got development requirements such as wetlands impacts, uh, stormwater uh, regulations, zoning, all kinds of things that you've got to deal with uh, when you're building uh, a new building. Demolition requirements, I'll talk a little about decommissioning and closure, um, but there are a lot of requirements that are triggered there. Although it's not environmental, uh, in our practice area we deal a lot with OSHA requirements. Uh, and you have an opportunity to make sure that your workplace is even safer when you're doing an expansion or a new development. Hi, Tom. It's Jennifer. Yes. I'd like to interrupt you quickly for a brief CLE announcement. Uh, please listen closely for the following CLE announcements. Those seeking CLE credits, please enter the following four-digit code into the CLE credit box that should now be appearing on the bottom right of your screen. The code is 2431. Additionally, those seeking Kansas, New Jersey, or New York CLE credit are required to use the same four-digit code to complete the attorney affirmation form. The code again is 2431. To obtain a copy of the attorney affirmation form for Kansas, New Jersey, or New York CLE credit, Download it from the Files box at the right side of your screen, or you can email me, Jennifer Bartz, at jbartz at foley.com. Once again, the code for CLE and the attorney affirmation form for Kansas, New Jersey, New York CLE is 2431. This concludes the CLE announcement. Uh, thanks, and back to you, Tom. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, citing is a... Um, big decision uh, where you're going to build your new plant. Are you going to build a brand new plant? Are you going to expand at an existing location? Are you going to take a mothballed plant and reopen it? There's a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, what are the taxes? What kind of in, uh, incentives are you going to get from, um, from the, um, the local 
government and the state, uh, what kind of workforce do you have. Uh, one of those factors is environmental requirements. Um, it's usually not the overarching requirement, but it certainly can be a major factor in decisions about siting. Uh, there are federal permits. There can be state and local. Um, one of the, the key components to making a good siting decision is to have as complete an operational data as you can, uh, because that's going to trigger what kind of requirements and what level of requirements are going to apply. There are site-specific requirements, for example, for air if you're in an attainment or a non-attainment area, for water if you have a TMDL, uh, total maximum daily load requirement on the water body you're going to discharge to, can have real limitations on what kind of operations you're going to be able to have. I already mentioned development regulations, but um, uh, if uh, the area you want to expand in has significant challenges from stormwater or wetlands, that can be a factor as well. Um, although most uh, the the phenomenon of of opposition to a new con new facility construction is a lot more common with things like a landfill or a prison. There are a number of examples where manufacturing facilities have run into uh, significant local opposition to building a plant. Um, it can it's often from perceived um, uh, issues rather than real. Uh, risks that are created by the plant, but nonetheless, it can be a real problem. Uh, one one worst story I have is uh, trying to cite a plant where the opposition symbol was a green ribbon, and every car antenna, doorknob, uh, mailbox, uh, and storefront had a green ribbon in it in the whole town where the facility was looking to locate. So uh, planning for uh, community relations is, is a key component. Another factor is the lead time. Um, uh, in today's climate, uh, a lot of the regulatory agencies are very interested in new manufacturing development and can be pretty cooperative. Uh, that's not always true, but it's a lot more common than it used to be that uh, you, the regulators are uh, generally uh, in a friendly frame of mind. But even having said that, uh, there is a complex set of regulations for many of these environmental permits and you're going to have a back and forth. You're going to prepare a permit application. You're going to submit it. You're going to get comments back from the agency. You're going to respond to those comments, and you're, you're going to go back and forth. Um, there may be uh, issues that come up that you have to uh, actually go into to litigation over, either from a, a citizens group opposing the agency, or if you run into one of those agencies that's not quite so cooperative, they can uh, have a proposed permit condition that you just can't live with, and you're going to have to challenge that. So. Um, if you've got a schedule for when you want to open the new plant, you need to build in realistic time frames for getting your environmental permit. I mentioned the uh, regulatory climate and um, knowing uh, the local regulators and the, the federal regulators and what their views are on your particular type of operation is, is a very big component in making this all run smoothly. A team approach, you're going to have a, a team of, of folks dealing with siting, um, both on environmental issues and non-environmental issues. You're going to have uh, environmental consultants and engineers uh, and lawyers from their various disciplines, and it's really important to make sure that all of that works well together. Um, corporate environmental policy, um, you are going to uh, have an opportunity when you're doing a new development like this to, to meet your corporate environmental policy, and that's going to be uh, where you should start from and where you should end at. Uh, there's more and more common to have worldwide standards on many things, and so you're not only going to be worried about your local requirements, but, but how you fit into it. Um, we've already talked about um, SEC reporting sustainability. Um, <clears throat> confidentiality, just to mention that um, it's important to, to, to not release your uh, information until you're absolutely ready to do so, both for um, liability reasons, but also for, for competitive advantage from other folks who are in your same business. Um, we're basically out of time, just really quickly on closure. Um, closing plants, uh, there's a lot of non-environmental requirements uh, that can be triggered and notices that can have to be made, particularly if you're laying off certain numbers of people. 
Uh, but when it comes to environmental regulations, there may very well be closure permits that you're required to do. Um, there are waste issues in terms of if, if particularly older plants, if you've got asbestos, lead paint, PCBs, uh, so you'll have those waste management issues, uh, closure of storage tanks. Uh, many environmental permits have financial assurance mechanisms where you have to have a bond or a letter of credit or an insurance policy that may be triggered by closure. Uh, and then you may have uh, uh, air credits or water credits that you want to transfer to a new facility. And with that, uh, oh, uh, we've already talked about the, the teamwork aspect of it and reasonable timelines. So we are at the end. Jennifer, you have the... Thanks, Tom. Uh, we're going to open this up for Q&A. Uh, at the moment to see if we get anything to answer in our very short time we have left. And seeing that there are no questions in the queue, we'll wrap up for the um, program. Thanks for joining us today, and we invite you to contact any of today's speakers if you have additional questions or would like more information on particular topics. Uh, today's program, as a reminder, was recorded and will be available on Foley's website in the next few days. If you have any questions regarding CLE for this program, please contact me at jbarkz at foley.com. And finally, please take a minute or two to give us your feedback about the presentation today using this link or the uh, screen that has just popped up for you. It's important for us to know your thoughts and helps us share our programs going forward. Thank you very much. And this does conclude today's presentation. Thank you for your participation.